morning, everyone. I'm Mark Houston. I'll be with you for the next two days. Um, this is the cardiovascular module, two. So is everybody in the right place? Good. Uh, the amount of material that you have on your CD is fairly enormous. Uh, basically, we're trying to cover the entire integrated cardiovascular medicine in, in about 14 hours, which is a task that's quite daunting. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, pick out the really pertinent things on the slides. It would be physically impossible for you to sit there and absorb it and for me to probably present it in the time we have. So what I'm going to do on the first part is go through vascular aging, uh, which sets the stage in vascular biology and how this relates in a very pathogenetic mechanism to cardiovascular disease. And then we'll follow that with integrative hypertension therapy then uh, integrated dyslipidemia, which, in which there are a lot of uh, great new concepts, but also a lot of myths that we have to dispel. And we'll wind up uh, with cardiovascular risk factors, which are expanded, uh, non-invasive cardiovascular testing, and then finally um, some real practical discussion about metabolic cardiology, and then we'll put it all together with some case presentations. So let's get started. Um, if, you're on your, if you're on your computer with your DVD, let me ask you to go to uh, the one on vascular aging because what I've done is try to incorporate really the first three lectures into one so all the slides are there. You've got a lot more in your DVD than you're gonna, than we're gonna present. But let's start with the actual vascular aging talk we're gonna be following along. William Osfer uh, very astutely said that a man is as old as his blood vessels. And as you look at vascular aging <clears throat> and aging in general, there's a very high correlation between what your arteries are doing and what you're doing in general as you're aging. Um, and we have tests now that can actually determine your accurate vascular age, which in turn really correlates it at like a 0.9% for your true age. Um, the cardiovascular risk factors that tend to occur in industrialized countries are coronary heart disease, MI, stroke, heart failure, and other types of cardiovascular disease. And one of the key uh, parts of this lecture is for us to begin to recognize and treat these about 20 to 25 years earlier than we're doing at present to actually prevent disease, not be inter intervening in disease. <clears throat> So let's start with some very basic vascular biology issues first. Uh, the arterial wall is um, composed here, the lumen, all the blood elements separated by a very thin layer of endothelium that determines actually what happens both within the blood vessel lumen but also in the arterial wall which is below it of the vascular media. Normally the endothelium is very smooth, monolayer, but when it comes disrupted, which is endothelial dysfunction, it's going to look like this on the left, and that creates both a structural as well as a functional abnormality. So the endothelium is communicating with the blood, telling the platelets to coagulate. Uh, monocytes, which are the first step in atherosclerosis, typically are not adhering to the endothelium. It's like Teflon, nothing will stick. But once things become dysregulated, you start to have monocytes and other white cells sticking to the endothelium and they, and they migrate into the subendothelial layer and cause the first step in atherosclerosis. So inflammation is, is sort of the key word in the early stages of vascular disease. In addition, the endothelium is communicating below to the vascular smooth muscle, determining permeability. And one of the ways you can look at that clinically is urinary microalbumin. It's a very sophisticated test for picking up early vascular disease. Uh, contractility related to hypertension growth, left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, stiff arteries, and finally oxidative uh, stress redox potential. When you're treating patients, what you want to try to do is to balance the scale to the upper part where you're causing vasodilatation, growth inhibition, antithrombosis, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant and try to avoid any of the things going down the other side which are going to promote atherosclerotic vascular disease. This looks uh, quite complicated. It's the uh, sort of the scheme for vascular biology, but 
I really want to distill this down to two things. Um, do we have a pointer, by the way? Where's our AV guy? I have a very long arm, but it won't go that far. Um, all right, I want to concentrate on just two parts of this. To get you oriented, the green represents the, um, the endothelium, and across the top are white circles, which really are the receptors for circulating hormones, neurochemical mediators, and so forth. And then red would be your vascular smooth muscle. So let's just take two things which most of you are familiar with. Uh, over here, let's look at angiotensin II, which has a receptor. It's called the AT1 receptor. That receptor is um, generally a proatherogenic, pro-inflammatory, uh, pro-hypertensive hormone and receptor, which sets off a cascade of events. But the one I want you to remember is that angiotensin II increases the production of radical oxygen species, specifically superoxide anion. The balance of that is over on the other side <coughs> with nitric oxide, and that's mediated through the bradykinin receptor, BK receptor. And nitric oxide is produced through a precursor, which is L-arginine, and a very important enzyme, which you're going to hear over and over again, called ENOS, which is endothelial nitric oxide synthetase. Well, what is in important about this, those two come together in a common ground. And what it relates to is the superoxide anion. The superoxide anion produced through the A2 receptor cancels out nitric oxide. So it's a plus minus and it's gone. So if you have an, a system that is overridden with angiotensin II, it decreases nitric oxide bioavailability, which is going to increase vascular damage. Now that's vascular biology, it's very simplified, but for you, uh, practicing and describe, prescribing nutraceuticals and or drugs, if you understand that simple principle, then it will guide you through everything else we're going to talk about in the next two days. So <clears throat> this is just another way of looking at it. You've got the AT1 receptor over there going down producing superoxide anion, L-arginine, ENOS, nitric oxide, and there's where the two come together and they basically cancel each other. And the results of that uh, are basic constriction and atherosclerosis and all the other pro-inflammatory things we mentioned. So angiotensin II then becomes a inflammatory oxidative stress, thrombotic, growth, vasoconstricting, hypertensive, and atherosclerotic hormone. Nitric oxide balances that as an anti-inflammatory, antithrombotic, reduces oxidative stress, is antihypertensive, vasodilates, anti-growth, and anti-atherogenic. The endothelium has a finite number of ways to respond to an infinite number of insults. As I'll show you in the next two days, we've been told for years that there are five major coronary heart disease risk factors. There are at least a thousand. And uh, of those thousand, there are probably about 200 that really are important for us to recognize. They range from all the genetic issues through emerging risk factors, which we're going to talk about. The point is this. When you have this many risk factors, which could be infinite, impending on the endothelium, it can only respond in a, in a very finite way. So all the things that are listed up here, and we can class them into two things. Biohumoral would be things like homocysteine, lipids, glucose, versus biomechanical, which is everything related to the blood pressure pulse pressure, oscillation, whatever. So those two major risk factor groups attack the endothelium, and the response that it has is identical, no matter what the risk factor is. And that response is basically inflammation, oxidative stress, and vascular autoimmune disease. And those are the three primary reasons that you have vascular problems. The whole purpose of functional medicine and metabolic cardiology is to learn the basic reasons that people develop vascular disease and then plug in your therapy to attack the basic problems. So if you want to remember the most important thing I'm going to tell you today, and I'm going to reemphasize this over and over again, is those three things. is the pathogenetic reasons that you have vascular problems. Let me repeat them again. Inflammation oxidative stress, 
and autoimmune vascular dysfunction.